Okay, so hello everybody. My name is Natalia Skrzypek. I know it's hard to pronounce it because <laughs> it's Polish surname. So today I will be speaking about the aftermath of the immigration in the art of the Neo-Assyrian period. Um, yeah, so uh, the Neo-Assyrian Empire or late Assyrian Empire uh, are the terms used by scholars to denote the third phase of ancient Assyrian civilization beginning in the middle of the 10th century and ending with the fall of Nineveh in 612 BC. It is said that during this time, Assyrian Empire reached the largest extent uh, under the dynasty of Sargonids and their successors. The most important cities in the area of Neo-Assyrian Empire, which was the territory around the Tigris River, Upper and Lower Zab, were, as we can see, the Ashur, uh, Kalhu, Dur-Sharukin, or Forsabat, Arbela, and Ninva. This period is also characterized by the reign of the strong kings from Ashur Natsilpal II to Ashur Banipal, but last is the reign of Ashur Ubalit II. Some scholars uh, call it the first empire of the world uh, history. Assyrians at this time, especially the kings, have seen themselves as people who needed to save others from the dangers of the outside world, uh, which was the outside of their empire. So this way they justified their conquers. Almost every year, Assyrian army was attacking towns and cities outside the empire, robbed them, forced their tributes, and sometimes annexed them. It was the time of great conquest, uh, which we can call the period of mass deportations of civil people under the reign of Neo-Assyrian kings. So mass deportations were a typical feature of the policy of the Neo-Assyrian empire. Even if the policy of mass deportation was present during the reign of kings in power during the so-called Middle Assyrian period, which we can see the map of, uh, on the left side, uh, the phenomenon of the large-scale uh, deportation of a civilian population became a regular uh, procedure under the new Assyrian kings. We have to remember that the resettlement of the groups of people during that time was mostly a usual practice to avoid the possibility of local rebellions. According to the research, more than 1.5 uh, million people were relocated during this time. There are some evidences that deportees were treated badly by the kings, but also the opposite way. For example, in the inscriptions of the king Ashur Natsipal II, uh, foreigners are described as being objectively strange and subhuman, often compared with animals. Despite this, deportees were most of the time valued by the kings. They were interested to have them in a good condition so they could use them uh, for the benefits of the Assyrian Empire. They wanted them to work for their glory as uh, craftsmen or uh, soldiers. Their relocation was a strategy uh, which was planned and well organized. We must also remember that people were not forced to leave their territory alone, but with their families, uh, which shows that most of the time it was not such an aggressive operation. My paper is about the, uh, the art of Neo-Assyrian period, but uh, the inseparable part of it uh, were the royal inscriptions. Uh, so they were put at some kind of commentary accompanying the images. So indeed, uh, they were part of the decorations, of, as we can see, paintings or reliefs adorning the palaces of Neo-Assyrian rulers. Let us mention the inscription relating to the first palace ever building, uh, built during the New Assyrian period under the reign of the king Ashur Natsipa II uh, at Kalhu. We can see uh, the steel uh, because uh, the inscription was uh, the steel. So uh, uh, it follows like this. Uh, the ancient city Kalhu, which Salman Asad, king of Assyria, a prince who uh, preceded me, had built the city, had become uh, dilapidated. It lay dormant. I rebuilt the city. I took people which I had conquered from the lands over which I had gained dominion, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I founded there a uh, palace of cedars, cypress, the prano juniper, boxwood, meshkan wood, terebinth, and tamarisk as my royal, royal residence as for my lordly leisure for eternity. 
And so this inscription demonstrates that the, the king was proud to em uh, employ uh, deported immigrants to build uh, his temporal uh, residence. This is not explicitly recorded, although it is, pos uh, uh, it is possible to guess that uh, the king himself did not perform all of the actions mentioned uh, in the inscription. Interestingly, uh, there is ample evidence that the people from the outside of the empire brought their uh, local traditions to Assyria, as can be seen among other things, uh, in the distinctive architectural plans and images depicting the history of the, cent the center's uh, rulers executed in reliefs and paintings. In 879 BC, Ashur Natsipa II decided to build his residence in Kalfu, which was already mentioned by me. Uh, he employed, employed thousands of workers and deportees to build his whole architectural complex, which you can see uh, on my presentation. What is important here is the fact that this uh, palace has no earlier uh, precedent. It is said that the inspiration for the architecture may have come from a palace in Arslan Tash, now in northern Syria, which was the center of uh, Aramean uh, Iron Age uh, Kingdom. It is probably because of the king's conquer of the Arameans, uh, who brought their own concept of building from the western part of the ancient world uh, to the new Assyrian Empire. It is also said that the inspiration for the architectural deco decoration, which we can see, barely but still <laughs> on the presentation, uh, came from the Mediterranean region, uh, most probably from Neo-Hittite Hittite art. So it was not unusual that Neo-Assyrian kings emphasized that something was inspired by the foreign patterns. Uh, for example, we know that the, the king Sennacherib mentioned in his annals that his building the type of Bit Kilani was built as a replica of a Hittite um, palace. Uh, inscriptions placed uh, on the carved uh, figures on the palace uh, guards called Lamasor. Aradlamu contained this information, uh, as we can see, and the building is just like in the middle of uh, the relief. Uh, architectural sculpture of Neo-Assyrian time is clear, clearly uh, an experiment for which the inspiration was taken from the North Mesopotamia and North Syria. There is a theory that decorating palaces with relief orthostats were borrowed probably from the Hittites who decorated their residences with this type of sculpture and whose region and people were in, incorporated into the Assyrian Empire. It is because the architectural sculpture of Neo-Hittite or Armenian kingdom was very similar, uh, as we can see, uh, to the one in the northwest palace of uh, King Ashun Natsipal. For example, uh, the ones from Zinjirli and Karkemish, uh, which we can see on the screen right now. As I mentioned, the portis were picture, uh, pictured as a part of the illustrations for the king's annals made as narrative sculpture scenes decorating the walls of their palaces. They were mostly shown as traveling groups, often riding animals or holding their possession. Of course, artists of, uh, or craftsmen uh, who did those pictures used some kind of formulas uh, to show that the portis were different than, let's say, uh, the real Assyrians. Uh, so the pictures had to be clear, uh, so it's easy to distinguish people from the outside of the Assyria in the narrative scenes. And uh, here we can see the soldiers, uh, the real Assyrians, and we can see uh, that the deportees, uh, they are uh, pictured as not, uh, their posture is not uh, straight, they are uh, some kind of wavy and uh, their uh, headgear and uh, uh, clothes are different than the Assyrians. Uh, what is interesting, those who were assimilated with Assyrians were indistinguishable from them. So there is an example of Tiglat Pilasar III relief showing two scribes. Uh, the first one holds a clay tablet in his one hand and the stylus in his other hand. The second, who is standing behind the first, is holding a roll. As we can assume, uh, they are the scribe of the cuneiform and uh, the writer of Armaic, because uh, the second one is holding also a brush, so he was probably writing on uh, some kind of soft uh, material. 
It means that the scribe who is writing with the brush is not a real Assyrian, but he uh, assimilated into the population of the empire because he also looks like the Assyrian scribe. What is interesting that women and children are more likely to be depicted as foreign people than Neo-Assyrian women and children. There are some exep uh, exceptions showing women uh, from Eli Elite, but uh, it is not as common as uh, in this case with the parties. So we can see uh, um, this example on the relief showing prisoners from Lakish. The decoration is from Sennacherib's Southwest Palace uh, at Ninva. Uh, what can be seen uh, in one of the relief bands is a card with sacks on which two women and two children are seated. Firstly, it is an unusual scene because of the behavior uh, of the people depicted. In the art of Neo-Assyrian period, it is rare to show emotion. But here, the mother's concern for her offspring, who are strongly physically attached to her, is even uh, literally shown. And secondly, uh, these are very rare non-male characters in this type of art, but not in this type of representations. Uh, at the very end, I would like to briefly mention that it was not only people who were deported by the Assyrians. Uh, they were very keen to bring exotic animals like camels on, or monkeys and plants into their territory through conquest, uh, creating a kind of paradise on earth uh, within their premises. We can see this on a bust relief from the palace of King Ashur Natsipal II and also read the, its description, as we can see, uh, to the right of this uh, relief. So as we can see, the kings established some kind of zoological parks, typical of Assyria, where they kept these animals and plants, which were unusual for Mesopotamian areas. The explanation for these actions uh, are described in one of uh, my favorite quotes taken from a book uh, about the history of animals in the Middle East. As follows, uh, they fulfilled a clear propagandistic function, proving that the empire was able to sublimate and integrate into its own schemes not only human beings, but also plants and animals, starting with the most prestigious of all, the lion, clearly the equi equivalent of the king. The world finally controlled both the Assyrian order. And with this quote, I would like to end my presentation. <laughs>